I have flown. I have sailed. I have moved about this world of ours. And ever in search of the finest of its kind, we bring you the top. In spine chillers. The creaking door. Take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. Good evening, friends of the creaking door. The creaking door is so creak, so do, Captain. It won't take long, your visit. No more than half an hour. Of course, it may seem longer. But we promise to return you to where you're sitting now, intact. Except for your sanity. <laughs> against her husband, as if seeking protection from the malignant forces of nature. Oh, I thought that was frightening. <laughs> Depends on the way you look at it. Some would regard those trees with their branches bending against the wind and the rain as a scene filled with dramatic grandeur. Oh, John, you're not writing one of your books now. I'm, I'm cold and I'm wet and I'm hungry. Oh, what a way to treat one's wife. I'm sorry, my sweet. The coast red looks so attractive on the map. John, sorry, I'm frightened. We could get into a skid or something and go hurtling down that cliff. All right. The next place we come to, we'll see if there's an hotel or something where we can stay the night. Oh, maybe, John. I don't feel like driving another 40 odd miles in this weather. Frankly, neither do I. Well, if you can find somewhere to stay, we'll telephone Jack and tell him to expect us sometime tomorrow. Yeah, it's difficult to see through the windscreen, mm. but I think we're coming to some sort of habitation. Well, let's head in that cell or something. Oh, look, there's a petrol pump. We'll inquire there. Mm, looks like some sort of general store. Well, look further along, darling. There seems to be a cluster of buildings. Well, let's hope somebody can put us up. There's no need to get out of the car, darling. Just stand the hooter. No point in the place with you, anyway. The place looks deserted. Oh, we must have somebody there. Oh, there's someone now. <laughs> he's dressed as though he's got a man a lifeboat. I can't blame him in this weather. Yes, sir. Oh, fill her up, please. Yeah. I've been pretty wild today. Dragon has it gone on all night. Going much farther, mister. We're making for Bridgeport. What's the road like? Oh, very bad until you get a Haley. That'd be about 25 miles from here. You be wanting anything else? Oh, no, thank you. Yeah, I think that's right. Ah, that would be just right. Thank you. But I say, my wife and I are not keen to drive all that distance in this weather. Is there any accommodation in the village? Village? <laughs> You'd hardly call this place a village. Ain't no hotel or anything, oh. just Mudridge Arms, and uh, that's a pub. Oh, well, I have five years, hotel. Until you get to Coombley, uh, 19 miles away. Oh, no. Well, isn't there anywhere at all? Surely this is a holiday resort in the summer. Not really. 
some folks come fishing and the like. Well, there's Cliff Edge. That'd be left British like, but you, you wouldn't want to stay there. Oh, why? Well, I'm sorry to keep you out in the rain. But... <laughs> Don't worry about me. This sou'wester keeps me dry. Uh, I put you up myself, but we ain't got You no said more... there's a place called Cliff Edge? I take the sort of place I'd like to stay at. Not after what happened. What did happen? They found her, they did. Found her body on the rocks. They say she jumped out of a window. Who owns this furnished house? Oh, no, Joshua Mugridge. He's on his small holding, he does. You see, it is you drive along the road called Mugridge Farm, it be. It's just you turn at the bend. You want to be careful at that bend in the road, only a few yards from the cliff edge. 200 foot drop it be. Uh, thank you. We'll be careful. Well, now, mister, take none of my business, but uh, I drive on a coomly if I were you. No good kicking your spirits now, is it? I suppose not. Well, thank you. Good night. Good night, you both. Good night. Hope you get fixed up all right. Oh, quite a character. If I put him in one of my books, I'd be accused of overwriting. What did he mean when he said, no good thing? Oh, you know what these country folk in remote areas are like. I doubt if they see any strangers from one month to another. Oh, darling, you're going to fall. Thing. There's a sign saying dangerous bend. Careful, darling. I'll be careful. I think we left our warm beds. Oh, there we are, darling. Look, Margaret's farm, it says. We'll be in front of a nice roaring fire in no time. You stay here, dear. There's no point in us both getting wet. Oh, somebody's had the car. I saw Shadow go across the mountain. Good. Hospitable. It's difficult to see in this rain. You stay where you are and I'll get an umbrella. Oh, well, that's as though our troubles are over. Perhaps you ought to drive on to Coombe. Will, will I ever understand? Here am I trying to get us food, warmth, and shelter because you've complained of the cold, hunger, and rain, and now you've changed your mind. I can't help thinking of that man as a petrol pump. He certainly had an odd expression on his face when he talked about this slit edge or whatever it's called. And what did he mean when he said... Here we are. Don't mind, Rufus. Now that his inspection is satisfactory, he'll go back to his kennel. He, he likes these storms no more than we do. Let me help you out, madam. Thank you. I'll come back for you, sir. I'll make a run for it. Through here, my parlor, I suppose you'd call it. If you'd both kindly be seated, I'll get you a little sustenance. Oh, thank goodness. I thought I was never going to get out of that car. It's been raining consistently ever since we started out. Mind you, it's the time of year for rainstorms. I'm afraid I've very little to offer you. A cup of tea, a glass of wine. Oh, well, if it's not imposing on you, I simply love a cuppa. Then tea it shall be. Uh, what about you, Mr. Uh, Neville, Don Neville? And this is my wife, Sally. You're Mr. Norwich, I think. That's right. Joshua Margridge, welcome to my humble home. As you can see, there's very little here. This shack and my few acres of vegetables. <laughs> Different from the old days when my wife was alive. I'll go and get your tea. Oh, Mr. Margridge, is that the kitchen through there? Couldn't I make a tea? Oh, it's very kind of you, but uh, there's no electricity in these parts. Do you know how to use one of those newfangled gas cookers? Indeed I do. Oh, no, no, don't bother to get up. I'm sure I'll find everything, and you two can discuss terms. Charming young woman, Mr. Neville. Been married long. Six years. Children. 
I'm not very... No. Well, you're both still young. So you want to stay the night at Kivadish? Mind you, when the storm clears, as it will, and the dawn breaks, and the sun seems to come out of the sea, <laughs> there's no more beautiful spot in the world than Cliff Edge. So you're willing for us to stay the night? At whatever your terms are, of course. I couldn't very well say no, with the weather being what it is. You don't seem very keen, Mr. Margridge. Well, I shouldn't worry unduly if the sheets are... Oh, it isn't that. You'll find plenty of clean sheets and blankets in the cupboards. It's just that... Well, Mr. Neville, although it's my house, there's some malignant influence occupying it. Oh, come now. Look, if you don't want us to rent your house... I do, I do, but I think I ought to warn you. Who's warning who about what? You go on making the tea, there's a good girl. I've got everything ready. I'm just waiting for the water to boil. I was about to tell your husband, Mrs. Neville. It's almost three years to the day. My wife, Jessica... She hadn't been well and insisted on sleeping in the guest room rather than I catch her cold. Ever since we moved into Cliff Edge, we'd heard strange noises, for which there was no reasonable explanation. I'll never forgive myself for allowing Jessica to sleep in the guest room. I woke up in the middle of the night. You may not believe it, but I was awakened by a cold, icy hand touching my forehead. Who's there? Oh, must have been dreaming. No. No. Heaven deserve me. It can't be. Jessica. Oh, no. 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 Oh, oh, heaven help us. Jessica. Jessica. I suppose you both regard me as just a superstitious old man, but when I summoned assistance and we got to my wife, she'd hurled herself from the bedroom French window to the rocks below. I tell you, when I got to my wife, her dear dead face was staring up at the moon, the horror, the expression of terror. Something had so frightened her. Sorry, foolish coroner, because my wife was given to nightmares, they brought in a verdict of death by Miss Adventure. Said she did it in her sleep. Oh, oh good. There's a kettle boiling up. I'll make the tea. I'd rather you hadn't told that story. My wife is highly susceptible to suggestion when it comes to ghosts and things. And you, sir? I'm a writer. Good heavens, forgive me, John Neville, of course. Didn't you write The Temple of Reason? Yes, I did. Yes, I, I've read quite a few of your books. It's a pleasure to meet you, sir. Thank you. I wonder what Sally's doing with that tea. I think... I... You think what, my darling? I'll leave it unsaid now that you've been a good girl and brought the tea. Uh, here, let me take it from you, Mrs. Neville. Thank you. I was just telling your husband how much I admire his books. So do I. Milk and sugar, Mr. Margaret? Uh, just one lump, thank you, and milk. He is a good writer, isn't he? Mind you, we shouldn't tell him that. He gets so conceited, don't you, darling? <laughs> I'm not a chance with you around, you little monster. <laughs> yes, a teacher. Uh, thank you. Ah, nectar of the gods. I think you'd better move on from here and not stay at Cliff Edge. Oh, dear. Just as I was beginning to feel snugly warm. Why do you say that, Mr. Margaret? My wife was not the only one who fled from some malignant force to her death.
You say there was another death? Unhappily, yes. Until the night of my wife's death, I too scorned what I used to regard as the superstitious nonsense of the uneducated. Yet nothing would have persuaded me to spend another night under that roof. I moved out of Cliff Edge and bought this small holding. As you see, I'm a man of modest means. Like yourself, a stranger inquired as to the possibility of obtaining accommodation in the district. I allowed a not unnatural sense of greed to get the better of my instincts. He rented Cliff Edge for a fortnight. After he'd been there three days, some children playing among the rocks found his main body. He'd obviously fallen from the same window. He, too, had a look of horror. Awful. Now, my dear, you understand my reluctance to offer you the shelter of Cliff Edge. What sort of shelter can it be that causes human beings to leap to their death? In your book, Mr. Neville, The Temple of Reason, your hero was a man who exposed a fake religious organization. But had you been through what I have experienced... Yeah, I've just noticed it. The rain has ceased. Then you're not required to stay at Cliff Edge. Oh, we'd like to very much. The roads will be in a shocking condition after all this rain. If you could tell us where we could buy some food... Oh, there are cooking facilities, I assume. Of course. Oh, darling, don't think me acting like a silly schoolgirl, but I think I'd be too afraid. Of... Oh, nonsense. I'll be there to protect you. you. Take my advice. However bad the condition of the road, it would be preferable to staying at Cliff Edge. Well, let me be honest with you. Were the roads tarmac all the way to my brother's house, were the sun shining and my wife and I had not driven so many miles, I would still relish the thought of staying at Cliff Edge. Oh, darling, don't be silly. It's the rough in Mr. Margaret. I think I understand your husband's attitude very well indeed. Shall we go? Or will there be room for me in your car? Plenty. I wish you'd change your mind, John. Now, darling, you said yourself you didn't want to act like a silly schoolgirl. Aren't you, Gert? Uh, uh, when the rain has stopped, everything's still the place dark and bleak and desperate. That's because there's still heavy clouds about and the evening shadows are beginning to fall. Mm-hmm. Things will look much more cheerful when they've got a fire going and the lights are on. There's so much rust on the lock. It's difficult to open. Ah, that's got it. There you are. Oh, thank you. And thank you for letting us have the bacon and the eggs and the milk. You will find tea and sugar in the canisters. Oh, dash it, I forgot to phone Jack. Oh, there's no telephone here, I'm afraid. The nearest telephone is at the Moggridge Arms, about two miles on the road. My family owned all this land at one time. It was a rather reckless grandfather who more or less impoverished us all with his gambling. I know what I'll do, dear. Mm-hmm. As soon as you're snappy in bed, I'll go over to the arms, telephone Jack and... Fraternize with the locals. Ever the writer, eh, Mr. Neville? Yes, Mr. Moggridge. A really professional writer never ceases to be anything else. Everything he sees and hears and does is stored away in his subconscious for future use. Oh, there he goes again, Mr. Moggridge, being all literary. If you don't mind, I'll leave you on the doorstep. I took a vow after my wife's death that I would never set foot in this place again, and I never will. Perfectly understandable. Well, I'll call in and see you tomorrow morning to settle up for would you rather... No, no. Tomorrow morning will do. You're still determined. I can't dissuade you. Good night, Mr. Margaret. Good night to you. Oh, it's all so musty in here. Well, of course it is. It's been shut up for so long. It's warm enough to open the windows, so let's let some sanity and air into the place. Come on, love. In we go. You're a marvel, my love. You take a prosaic dish like bacon, sausages and eggs, and you transform it into an Epicurean's delight. <laughs> oh, I've eaten enough to burst. You uh, still worrying, darling? 
I must say that now that the rain has stopped and the moon is out and we've got rid of that musty feeling around the place, I'm, I'm feeling a little different. But still a little apprehensive. John, you may be scornful, but the fact remains that two people left to their death from this house. You feel safe and secure down here. You don't have a feeling that there are phantoms, poltergeists, malignant forces. Now stop teasing me. It was all so dark before. And that old man... A very interesting character, Mr. Moggridge. Once he heard that I was the author of The Temple of Reason, that I scoffed at the supernatural, he was pretending to dissuade me to frighten us off. But in his eyes, there was a challenge. And you accepted the challenge. Yes, my love, I did. Are you sorry? Now that the lamps are lit and we're sitting in this cozy room with the fire shining brightly? <laughs> You're right, darling, as usual. I really couldn't face the rest of that drive. Good, we've allayed your fears. There's only one more enemy to defeat. Stop writing a script. I'm trying to put at rest the mind of the woman I love. Come on, darling. Let's go and have a look at the bedroom. All right. Which one? The well, main bedroom. The bedroom we're going to occupy. The one facing the sea. Come on. Oh, it's quite light now that the clouds have disappeared. Oh, there's sure to be a lamp in the bedroom. Oh, let's sleep in the guest room. No, my sweet. We will sleep with the window open and snore to the roar of the sea. <laughs> Fool. I think this is it. Oh, charming. I like the lamp. Oh, yes, the message, eh? Oh, what a lovely color scheme. Look at it. Does this suggest something evil? <laughs> no. She must have had very good taste, Mrs. Margridge. Uh, the way the color of the curtains blend with the carpet and the bedspread. Oh, I suppose that's where they keep the sheets in them. Oh, look, a portable transistor. Music to soothe the savage ghost. Oh, oh I've got an idea. While you're ferreting out the sheets and things, I'll go up the road, telephone Jack and drink with a local. John. Now, don't tell me you're still being influenced by that funny old man. No, no, not. All right, darling. I'll get everything shipshape, but don't be long. Promise. Bye-bye, love. You have been listening to The Benny Morris Show. And now here is a summary of the programs you can hear. Oh. Oh, Mr. Chief. Now, I Kill you if you killed your wife. Oh, it's only a joke. I was only playing it. I wasn't going to do any harm. Oh, oh, my. I can so uh, kill it all. Yes, dear. He just tried to paralyze you with fear and then chloroform you. Oh, Keep oh. still, you or I'll break your arm. And then he'd have thrown your body through that window and the sea would have washed all traces of chloroform away. You don't oh. understand. I only wanted to frighten you. You don't understand. You don't understand. Stop him. <laughs> There it is, Sergeant. There's the cotton wool he soaked in chloroform. Of course, he was as mad as a March hare. I don't suppose he would have got away with the other two murders were they not a Mogridge and they gave him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, perhaps it's just as well he died the same way as the others. Well, we might have been able to charge him with attempted assault, but we couldn't have proved he'd killed his wife or the man who took the house over. But he didn't mean to tackle both of you, sir, did he? No. I sit in the trap, Sergeant. I told my wife in front of him that I would be going to the Margaret's Arms to telephone my brother. I knew that he'd be watching this house, waiting for me to leave. All I did was to walk down the road, nip behind a hedge, and came back into the house through the kitchen door. From then on, I watched every move. I'm sorry I let you get such a fright, darling. Well, sir, I'll get back to Coombe. I never was satisfied with the verdict at the inquest on Mrs. Margaret or Mr. Burnside. Yeah. What about you two? Will you stay here the night? Well, not us, Sergeant. We'll drive to Coombe, too. I wouldn't stay a night under this roof for all the tea in China. Why, oh, I should 
think that would be my driver. Money? No one here. Yes. Seagulls. At least I think that's what it is. Well, let's go before I go off my rocket, too. his rocker, after all that he and his wife have been through, their only hope for a good night's rest is to uh, rocker themselves to sleep. invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present The Creaking Door.